Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Samantha Shokin, Manager of Public Programs, and it is my pleasure to introduce the first episode of our new online series, Generally Speaking, with host Stephanie Butnick, Deputy Editor of Tablet Magazine and co-host of the leading Jewish podcast, Unorthodox. The intention of this series is to shed light on an aspect of Holocaust memory that might often get overlooked, the experiences of three Gs, that is, third generation Holocaust survivors. What is it like growing up with a grandparent who lived through the darkest chapter of Jewish history? We are here to explore this question in all of its complex dimensions. With us today are guests Alyssa Greengrass Summer and David Wax. Alyssa is the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors and serves as chair of the Young Friends of the Museum. She is also active with the organization 3GNY, an educational nonprofit founded by grandchildren of survivors to preserve the legacies and lessons of the Holocaust. Alyssa works as Senior Leadership Giving Officer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And David is the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. He has been active with 3GNY since its founding in 2005 and has served as its president since 2017. David is an avid traveler and has visited his grandparents' hometowns and many concentration camp sites across Europe. He works as VP of Information Technology at a hedge fund in Manhattan. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our partners for tonight, the Young Friends of the Museum and 3GNY for their help making this event possible. And finally, just a quick note that we will have time for audience QA at the end of tonight's program. So feel free to submit your questions and comments into the chat box and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. So that's it for me. Uh, welcome Stephanie, David and Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks. I'm that person in your Zoom meeting who doesn't unmute themselves. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you both tonight and for everyone to be here with us. This is obviously the first, um, as Samantha said, the first in a new series all about the third generation or 3G experience. Um, I wanna thank Samantha and Rita at the Museum of Jewish Heritage for having me. This museum has been an important part of my life for as long as I can remember. And so it's really meaningful for me to be part of this series. We have two wonderful guests tonight, um, David Wax, Alyssa Greengrass Summer. They are both active in the 3G community and they share their grandparents' stories regularly at events um, around New York City. Tonight I hope will be a little different because we're gonna talk about them, um, specifically what it's like to be the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. Um, we all know there's a lot of research and writing about the, the experiences of the children of Holocaust survivors, uh, but what we wanna do with this series is explore the next generation, um, people who, came of age with grandparents who survived the unthinkable. Um, I'm the grandchild of Holocaust survivors myself. My grandparents died when I was very young, so I didn't get to spend uh, the time with them that I would have liked to. And I've spent much of my life um, studying and writing about Holocaust memory and legacy, I think, as a result of that. Um, tonight is not about me, though. It's about Alyssa and David. So welcome to you both. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> Um, so we're so happy to have you you both with us. So let's let's start at the beginning. Um, will you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, any early memories of your grandparents? I mean, do you remember learning that they were survivors or that there was sort of something different maybe about your family? Sort of what, what were your earliest memories in that sense? Um, Alyssa, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you again so much for having me. Um, I grew up in Great Neck on Long Island. It was nice to see a bunch of <laughs> Temple Israel members on this chat. Um, I, you know, I grew up just in a really happy household and knew my grandmother. Um, my grandparents who are survivors are both my dad's parents. Um, unfortunately, my grandfather passed away before, uh, when I was really, really young, I was a baby, just a few months old. Um, and I knew my grandmother, you know, she was about 13, when I was 13 rather, was around the time when um, I really, you know, got to know her the best and started talking about this part of her experience a little bit more with my parents around that time. Um, my parents never really talked to me that much about the Holocaust. I peripherally knew and I understood that my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, um, but truly it was not something that they consciously sat me down to talk about. They didn't want it to be something I think that they burdened me with. And as I got older and I started asking a lot of questions and furthered my involvement with the Museum of Jewish Heritage, that's truly when 
honestly, my dad started opening up a lot more. The more I asked questions about it, the more he was willing to talk about it as he saw I was really craving that information. Um, and we know a lot more just broadly about my grandmother's story. She was very vocal to my dad, not to me and to my mom. Um, about her experiences and she participated in the Shoah Foundation tapes so we're so lucky that we have a long recording of her telling her testimony a full three hours um, which is so meaningful and was really kind of that first point for me to jump off and really have some information to go off of other than just broadly knowing you know my grandmother went to X camp and you know that was her experience. David what about you? I grew up in Bridgewater, New Jersey, um, which is in Central Park, very suburban town, and my grandparents lived in the Bronx. So my earliest memories of my grandparents are just always going to their apartment and spending time with them, but uh, neither of them ever talked about the Holocaust, not even once growing up. It was kind of just always there. I, I couldn't tell you when I first learned about it, but we knew that it was something that was different, but it was never talked about. My parents never really talked about it and the grandparents never really talked about it either. So it was just kind of like an odd thing. And even, even when we were younger, I have an older sister who's three years older and she went on the March of the Living. And even during that time, um, my grandmother never even spoke to her about it and like where she went. So it's pretty interesting, but we really never talked to them directly about it. So when did you realize that this meant that there might be sort of something different about you, right? If there was something different about your grandparents, um, like that this might, might also affect you. Was that something you processed at a young age? This idea of like third generation, was that like a term you heard? Never heard the term third generation. Uh, I will say, and maybe this is dating me a little bit, but um, I was around 25 and the first time I heard the term or heard of anything about it is it was on Friendster. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Friendster, but uh, a friend uh, posted something on Friendster about a gathering of three G's, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. And I was like, what is that? And I was like, that's me. I have to, I have to go there. I have to see what this is about because I've never spoken to anybody, even friends growing up when I was young, who I knew whose grandparents were survivors too. I never talked to them about this. So I had to like go to that event and kind of explore it. And that kind of opened my world and, and changed everything really. So we have friends sort of thank for you being here tonight. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> In charge of 3GNY to get that, that social media service back up and running. Um, what about you, Alyssa? Yeah, similarly, I had not heard the term 3G until uh, I started getting more involved just kind of in a community of people who wanted to be learning more about the Holocaust and searching for answers. And um, honestly, I think the first time I really heard the term 3GNY or just 3G was when my dad sent me a 3GNY event invitation. Um, and it was for a Shabbat dinner many moons ago. And I went, uh, met a lot of wonderful people there who then actually uh, introduced me to the Museum of Jewish Heritage and their young friends group, um, which I'm now very active in. Um, and so I think that's, honestly, I think even 3G and Y might have been like that first place where I really embraced the term of 3G and understood and was honestly in a room of grandchildren who sat down together and tried to say, what does it actually mean for us to have this kind of experience? What is it about all of us that we might have gone through? What is it about our parents that might be similar or different? What nuances are there there? And to really start to think about it that way. And so when you're in there in that room, are you immediately connected to these people? Like, is there sort of some unspoken pact that you both have sort of like a similar frame of reference for things? I mean, had you experienced that before in other groups? I think for sure, uh, on some level, there is. Uh, some, you know, I think in, in general, some people are just more open and, um, you know, can relate than others. But even so, I've seen where, you know, we've had discussion groups um, and we have quiet people come in, it's probably their first time, sitting in a corner, listening. And then as they start to see other people speak up and have, familiar experiences that are very similar to what these other people are describing, then they start to almost, you know, get excited. I see them like, you know, look at their friend like, oh yeah, that's me too, you know? <laughs> and uh, 
they get excited and then they start to participate and they have like that immediate bond like hey we went through kind of something together even though we, we didn't go through it but we, we we grew up in this in this in this frame of mind yeah i couldn't agree more it was it was one of those moments where you know i didn't necessarily even go into it thinking i'm just going to automatically connect with all of these people on this unspoken level but you really do you're just in a room with people and then all of a sudden you start talking about oh well and my dad felt the same way or my grandma was the exact same way and it just kind of spirals um from there and it's a really interesting important thing i mean we're there's very few fourth four g's who will have known survivors so it's really our generation that is the last group that's going to really, you know, have firsthand experience with survivors. And so you both do a lot of speaking work, um, sharing your grandparents' stories. I know they are long and amazing stories. Could you just sort of give us like the contour, the outline tonight, just give us a sense of, of what, of what those stories are? Let's see you go first. Sure. Um, so a very, very Cliff Notes version. Um, my grandmother was born in Hungary in 1918 and uh, had a family. She was married, had a baby girl when she was first taken to uh, a number of camps. She was shuffled amongst four camps, um, ultimately ending up in Bergen-Belsen. Um, my grandmother was one of seven. She lost all of her siblings except for one who actually left Hungary before the war started and went to Israel. And so I have an incredible group of cousins in Israel. Um, and my grandmother was immediately separated from her husband. Her child was immediately taken away from her upon arriving at her first stop. And um, afterwards, like I said, after being shuffled through a number of camps, um, was ultimately liberated from Bergen-Belsen um, and then was taken to a DP camp where she met my grandfather, um, who was from Poland and was married with a 13-year-old son, was taken to Auschwitz. Um, unfortunately, his wife passed away as well and um, his son was killed and he had to witness it. And um, my grandfather survived with his brother and actually the two of them were able to escape from Auschwitz. Um, <clears throat> uh, my grandmother grew up in a small town in Poland uh, named Stubnitz, and it was very close to the river that was split between Germany and Russia as to who whether they take over Poland. And she fled with a group of friends in the middle of the night when they heard that the Germans were coming, because she was on the German side, and, tried, and they heard that the Jews were treated better on the Russian side. So they rushed over to try and cross the river in the middle of the night, and they were actually captured uh, by, by Germans. And then they escaped where they were captured from and tried to go to the river again. And the Russians were there waiting with guns and they said, um, turn around or we'll kill you. And they said, kill us anyway, because if we turn around, the, the Nazis are gonna kill us. So, but in the end, they actually didn't kill them, but she ended up being put in work camps in Siberia. And from there, uh, when Russia had a pact with the Allies, they released her into uh, farmland in Kazakhstan. After that, she returned. I don't know much about my grandfather. He was in Poland, but what is now Ukraine, um, in Lemberg, which is Lviv now. Uh, and he was made to fight in the Russian army. And he was pretty proud of it. He, he always was proud of his Russian army uniform. But the story really is, is that he was a barber and supposedly a, a general really liked the way he cut his hair. So he always kept him off the front lines and, and that's how he survived. So these are stories that I am I'm imagining are more detailed than the ones you sort of get told firsthand. I mean, was there research? Was there travel? Like what, how did you, sort of go on a fact-finding mission really to sort of to understand these things um, and these stories for, for each of you. What was that process like? For me, a lot- You guys are too polite. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've known each other a long time. Um, for me, a lot of it, like I said, it really started when I saw my grandma's tape. Um, I mean, growing up, I honestly, I didn't even know for a while that this existed. My parents really wanted to shelter me from it. Um, they felt like it was the right thing to do at the time. And when I was able to finally watch her tape, I was 
so impacted and I just immediately wanted to know a lot more. And I saw the tape for the first time when I was about 16. Um, and at that point, my grandmother had already passed away. Um, at the end of her life, she was very unwell. And uh, once I saw the tape, I just immediately, like I said, I spiraled and I started asking a lot of questions. And when I was in college, I took Holocaust studies classes and um, just, you know, immediately once I figured out, you know, that the tape that she did was part of a larger initiative. I went down the rabbit hole of looking into the Shoah Foundation and then discovered that my grandmother had a whole profile on their website, which had a map that showed exactly which camps she went to at what point and had photos I had never seen of my whole life. I mean, there were pictures on the Shoah Foundation's website of my grandmother and her first husband, Martin Schultz, from their wedding. And it was incredible uh, how, these, how she even had these photos, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, with my involvement in the museum, the resources that they have there, being able to really take advantage of trying to learn more. And um, I've recently just gotten connected again with people at the museum with Jewish Gen. I want to continue to learn more. And, you know, especially with my grandfather's story, who I just don't know as much about um, because he himself didn't talk about it that much that, you know, my parents don't even have as many details as my grandmother's story. That's kind of next on my list is now I really want to see what can I figure out about my grandpa. David, what about you? Um, I, I don't have much to go on on my grandfather. I, we don't have much of a story. He never really talked about it. There are tidbits that kind of fly out from my dad. And sometimes even now, he, he remembers things that he never told me when I asked the questions when I was younger. Um, but uh, I know more about my grandmother, not to say that I know a ton, but it started out really just interviewing my parents first. Uh, apparently my, my grandparents did talk about it when my father was much younger and he learned a lot, but just by the time I was, came around, they just didn't talk about it at all. So I interviewed my parents. I talked to my aunts as well. Uh, I then, at the time, there was still my grandmother's sister alive. She was in Paris and I remember we called and we talked to her, had several interviews. And then I also went to Paris to see another not, I would say she's my great aunt, but it's not really a blood relative who, who is still alive today actually, and um, just had her 91st birthday, but uh, oh, interviewed her and learned a lot more about, not so much during the camps, but also about the aftermath and like where, how they ended up in Paris after, after the war. So I also went back to my grandmother's hometown uh, to see if I could find any information. I know there's still a lost brother, but I've never been able to find any information on that lost brother. And the town, going to see the, the hometown didn't really provide any new information for me at all. I think the thing that's so interesting about hearing you both talk is that because you weren't like given these stories, you had to find them a little bit. And so you sort of do the research, you do the legwork, and then what you actually end up, end up with is like this really, really full form story. Um, obviously not in every case, but you guys have basically filled in a lot of, of the missing pieces that, that sort of get lost or get filtered through the generations. And so I'm wondering if there is sort of this 3G, so to speak, um, sort of this like personal initiative that you felt where you were like, I don't know the full story. I need to, I need to use, you know, like this, the fact finding skills I learned in college, like how you sort of approach it. Did you approach it as a research project? I guess you could say it is. Uh, I mean, like, I will tell you that because it's like a mission to find the pieces, it makes it kind of exciting. You, you're, you're on this mission, you're trying to piece it together. It's, it's a puzzle, but it's, it's greater than a puzzle because it's intertwined with a lot of kind of different layers, maybe a 3D puzzle, you know, but- um, A 3G uh, puzzle. Yeah, 3G puzzle, but, <laughs> but, it, but it, it makes it kind of exciting because you want to go, you want to find more, you keep wanting to search. And uh, I mean, even today, I, I I said I didn't know much about my grandfather's story, but even just last October, I went to Ukraine to his hometown to try and see if I could find any more pieces because we really don't know much about his his childhood. I, I didn't come up with anything, but still, it's kind of like it's the excitement. It's part of the mission. It's it's uh, you know, uh, it makes it more interesting. I don't know. I mean, there is this other side of that, which is I spent a summer in Poland. While I was there, I traveled to my 
grandpa, my, my paternal grandfather's family's hometown. And my great aunt at the time who was from there had no, was, was sort of horrified by the fact that I was doing this, was telling me to be careful, you know, like had all these associations, whereas I came to the place sort of freer from that. And I'm wondering if you, if you got any sort of surprising pushback along the way of why are you, why do you want to go back? Why are you interested in the stories? Why are you dwelling on the past? I mean, sort of as, as the generations shift, our, our attitudes shape, change a little bit. Um, and since we're not so, so close to it the way the survivors themselves were, I mean, we have a, a bit more openness, I think. Is that yeah, something that I, either of you found? I would say I didn't have much pushback, but I've certainly seen it. <clears throat> I've seen it in like documentaries. I've seen it where I tell other people where I'm going and they're like, why would you go there? Like, I know that, uh, that, that, you know, great aunt in, in Paris, her husband said he never wanted to speak Polish again. Not once did he ever speak it ever since the war. Um, and they, they were, they, they couldn't believe that I was going to some of these places. So I think you're right. I think we, maybe being at least one generation beyond our parents, we have that kind of more to able, ability to freely go to seek out these stories and seek out these places. So I don't know, Alyssa, what do you think? I just find everybody so different. I think it's so personal. I feel as though I, I've known people who've gone back to these places with their grandparents and have, you know, had that experience as a whole family. Um, I, at some point, would like to go back and, you know, I'd like to go to Hungary. I'd like to try and find where my grandmother lived and um, go back to, you know, go to Poland at some point. I've not done anything like that um, quite yet, but I, I just, I think it's so personal. And I know my parents, um, you know, when I was growing up, I even remember like my parents for a while didn't buy a German car and then, you know, that changed. But like, you know, people have different associations with different things um, throughout their life. And they recently went on a vacation pre-COVID um, to Europe. And one of the stops was in Hungary and they didn't trace my grandmother, but they were just there. And I know that even that experience for them was complicated and they talked about it and just felt a little bit odd being there, which is, you know, completely understandable, especially for someone like my dad who grew up with two parents who are Holocaust survivors. And he said something to me the other day when we were just chatting about this, and it really stuck with me that I can, it's hard to process the fact that he was born just a few years after this all happened. I mean, I know that, I look at the dates, I can think about it logically, but when you really internalize what that means and what that must have felt like, and I think, well, where was I a few years ago? What does that time difference mean to me? It's almost, it's really, I struggle with trying to internalize and understand what that really must have been like. I do want to say that someone in the chat wants you, Alyssa, to say hello to your parents. <laughs> um, so we'll do that now. But, um, you know, speaking of your parents and, and your sort of your aunts and uncles, I mean, did, did, did it change their relationships with, with sort of Holocaust memory that you guys were sort of taking up the mantle and saying, this is something I care about. This is something I want to be involved with. I want to spend my time and I want to, you know, really commit to this. Was that, has that sort of changed the trajectory of your family in any way? Well, both of my parents were only children, actually. So I don't have aunts and uncles. I've got a relatively small family um, until now. Now my siblings are married and I'm married, but my siblings have lots of children. And so now there's lots of grandchildren. The family's getting bigger, but um, even out of my siblings, I was the one who really was the most interested, asked the most questions, um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that might be. Um, honestly, my grandmother was very difficult, and she, you know, was very difficult to a lot of my family, and, you know, undiagnosed PTSD in a time where mental health was not a conversation, it was not you know, who knows, but my siblings are much older than I am. So I knew my grandmother when I was much younger. I think there's a lot of layers there um, as to perhaps why I'm the one who's more interested in this. Um, but it really was me and who kind of is spearheading all of this. But I've been really just excited that my family has gotten more interested and intrigued about 
the research I'm trying to do and is getting more involved and they've, you know, supported me and come to a lot of Museum of Jewish Heritage events and um, they themselves are starting to participate in more conversations. Yeah, I never had any, I would say, pushback from it, but even like, I know my aunt, you know, she's eight and a half years younger than my father. Her, uh, so she, I think my grandmother was 40 when she had her and she never wanted to ask any questions because she was always afraid of my grandmother, her mother crying. She didn't want to see her sad because she was always already kind of so sad. Um, I think the fact that I've been digging around and finding these stories has made her so happy because maybe she didn't have the courage or didn't want to back then to do it, but uh, she's able to find out so much about the family and her mother, you know, and what had happened like leading up to the time that she knew her. Um, I think it's been, I think it's been great. I think like even other parts of my family, I've done stories. I've actually done two great aunts and some of these stories they never knew about. And, and now that I'm interviewing and documenting it, so they also have it for their own families, I think is, is really important, but also they, they end up knowing where a little bit more about where they come from and, and their own history. I love that. I mean, I think something that you're both saying just really, really sounds, sounds right on this idea that, you know, but when our parents were born, when, you know, people, the second generation was born, the trauma was really fresh, right? Like those, and those relationships, I think in a lot of ways were tough. I mean, they were beautiful and amazing, but I think being raised by a Holocaust survivor is not necessarily the easiest thing. And so I think we sort of spent a lot of time thinking about like the psychology of, of those relationships and, and of the second generation. But I think that what's so interesting to me about the third generation is that we meet these, these people, these survivors as grandparents, right? And they are cuddly and loving and they're, they're sort of a, you know, the way you are with your grandchildren is fundamentally different than the way you are with your kids. I mean, I just think that's how, how life works. And so I think there's, there's something that an openness there. And, and, you know, a lot of people in the comments are saying that there may have been a willingness to speak to actually to speak to the third generation, even if you didn't speak to the second generation. So I think, I think that's really interesting. And I'm wondering if, if that's something you've seen more broadly in your, in your work with, with the 3G community, the timing sort of worked out a little bit better for us. Well, I, I will say one thing I, I would say my, and just as myself as an example, I would not say that my grandmother was warm and cuddly. I'm not sure. I said cuddlier. I, cuddlier. I'm not sure if that works out for everybody, but I think, I actually think from seeing like people who say that their grandparents are happier and more warm and cuddly are usually the ones who are more open with telling their story. Um, I don't know if I can say that as like a general statement, but I think from like what I've seen among some people I've talked to, it does seem to be that way. I don't know, Alyssa, what, have you seen similar? Um, I've honestly, I've seen both. And, you know, in the case of my, of my grandparents, um, my grandmother talked about it again, not really to me, but to my, my family, the rest of my family, nonstop was a complete open book. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, to me, she always called me her little ballerina, though I'm not a dancer, don't know where that came from, <laughs> from being a little kid, um, but was, had, you know, some very difficult relationships with the rest of my family, and it was very complicated. Um, so I think it really just depends on, you know, who, who the person was. I, I find too, it also depends how old they were when they went through their experience. Yeah. What was their experience? I mean, both of my grandparents lost children. They lost not just their siblings, their families, but they lost children. And, um, you know, starting a new family like that is, adds other layers as well. I, I would say the big thing here, really, aside from how they acted, uh, the grandparents, is that no matter whatever effect they had on, on uh, you know, their children, the 2Gs, it, there is an effect on 3Gs too in certain ways. It does trickle down. There's been, you know, studies about, you know, passing a generation and somehow affecting it because maybe, as you said, you, as a 3G, you might spend more time and, and listen to more as they open up more to you where you might receive the effects from those stories more than, say, your father or mother. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've only like 
touched the beginning of that in terms of these studies, but uh, I, I don't know, but there's definitely something to it there. And, and also the idea that the three G we the, the three is is in relation to the one and also the two, right? So there's there, there's two relationships there that are right complex yeah. and dynamic. Um, I do want to tell you um, that where is this? Sorry. Oh, uh, David Aunt Sandy says you're doing a great job. So thank you, Aunt Sandy. Good <laughs> Shout out to Aunt Sandy. <laughs> I, I we have a lot of questions coming in. We're gonna have a really fun um, Q and A period, but I do want to know i mean can you extrapolate anything like you're talking a little bit about families that are more open versus families that don't talk about it i mean among the people that you're seeing in these three gny groups of these events they're all searching for something i mean is there something that brings them together is there something that can you sort of make any broad statements about who what you know who's who wants to talk who doesn't stuff like that well let's see you go first <laughs> thanks david um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm involved in the community with 3 gny I'm heavily active with the Young Friends of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And in both spaces, I would say the 3 Gs are just, they're driven, they're driven by wanting to tell their family stories. But speaking for myself and for those I've spoken to, a lot of it too is what, what do these stories teach us? What can we be doing and sharing with future generations about what it means when anti-Semitism gets out of control, when um, we're not thinking and forcing ourselves to be a more tolerant society. And there's a lot of social layers there that are so important to be teaching. And, you know, the time that schools truly spend in their history classes talking about the Holocaust is so minor that it's a paragraph usually, <laughs> unless, you know, certain particular schools choose to make it larger units. And what that does is it just completely waters down the gravity of what the Holocaust was. I mean, you see six million and you can't quite process that. It just kind of sometimes can wash over for kids. And I've seen that in some of the volunteering I've done where I've gone into these classrooms and spoken to kids who, you know, they, I ask them what they know and what they feel about the Holocaust. And they say, you know, we know a lot of people died. We know Hitler was bad. But then when you start really getting down and sell it, telling someone an individual story and putting it into a real picture that all of a sudden this person in front of them has a grandma who went through this, it just completely shifts it. And so the people I've spoken to are really in it for that. I mean, we want to preserve the stories of our families. It's so important for our family history and for the importance of you know, the Jewish community at large, but it's, it's much bigger than that. It's, there's a lot of lessons that can be taught. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in our society and we can be just a small part of that through our personal experiences. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> I think people are drawn to 3G, like the community at large for many different reasons. Some are looking to connect, some are looking to learn about their own history, learn about history at large in general. Um, some are looking to help them figure out how to document their grandparents' stories. Some end up coming to just learn to like write a book or even, you know, as, as uh, Alyssa said, to speak in classes. What, what we feel is very important is using that story in the classroom experience, like what Alyssa is saying, but by, instead of reading it in a book, or talking to someone like a, just a teacher, we have the ability to use our grandparents and, and our personal connection to them to tell the story almost firsthand, you could say, not firsthand because we're not the survivors themselves, but we're telling it about the people we know and how we know them. And I think that makes large leaps over someone just telling the story from a history book or even just you know, reading it out loud to an audience. So before we turn the floor over to the questions, because there are lots of them, I just sort of want to ask you a little bit about this idea of like a 3G legacy. I mean, what have you seen? Obviously, what you both are doing, your work is amazing and, and really, really inspiring. Are there any sort of creative and interesting ways you're seeing fellow 3Gs em embrace and preserve their family's legacies? Um, <clears throat> I think, I think we, we see a lot of it. We see we just had an event on Monday where 
uh, a fellow 3G, uh, had written a book on her grandmother, and she 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 had a book. We had a book launch event. So there you go. You have 3Gs writing books on their grandparents. We have our we do program, which stands for you know we educate in the 3G and Y, and that is to train 3Gs in how to retell their story to make an impact in the classroom on the next generation. We have so many statistics and studies saying you know what is it like one in four or one in five millennials know about the Holocaust. I mean, if people don't know about it, how can we learn from it? And the stories and telling in the classroom is really to educate so the next generation can learn for it, not just to know about it, you know, what, what effects it ha that happened to the Jews, but for all people and, and to kind of use that to educate them against for, for all people. Yeah, I, really. I mean, I know so many people who've started to write down their own stories and put them into books. And at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, I know we've had film screenings by 3Gs and even a 4G with an HBO docu-series. Um, there's been just so many people who want to be sharing their stories and the institution really is supporting that. And um, through its exhibits, through its events, young friends and non-young friends related, um, there's just a lot of people who are really looking for that opportunity to be able to share their stories. And, you know, we're really lucky that New York City has the third largest Holocaust museum in the world. And, you know, we can use this institution and the institution really wants to be a place that is amplifying the stories of the third generation. As I mentioned, we are the ones um, who are mostly going to be the last to have known survivors. So I think this is a great jumping off point for a question that just came in, which is what advice would you give to a 3G who's preparing to share their grandparents' story with groups for the first time? You guys are the pros. <laughs> um, I would make sure that you focus on one story, one person. I would not want someone to have too many like, main characters in the story, you wanna focus on one person. Um, and I would uh, make sure, if, especially if you're talking in a classroom, uh, make sure you talk slow. Uh, and I would use some type of visuals to help them grasp how far distances are. I would research where they're talking. Like let's say I was talking in, um, you know, uh, St. Louis. And I said, hey, this is how far my grandmother traveled on a cattle car to New and the distance is from St. Louis to New York. That's how far they went on. So use, use uh, references for, for places so, so they can really visualize and kind of feel the story as you're going through it. Melissa, got anything? Yeah, I think visuals are so important. I mean, I agree with everything that David said. Um, I think the other thing I would just build upon what he started to say is with these visuals, you really want to paint the picture as much as possible and not just um, kind of go fact by fact in um, that way. You want to really share, you know, if you know and you're able to find out what it felt like for them in that moment. You know, in my grandmother's show a tape, she really really talks in great detail about what it felt like to be in that car, the cattle car, on her way to the camp. And she describes how dark it was and the smell and the crampedness. And I think the more you can, you know, add those elements in it, the more real and amplified the, the very real story becomes. Um, I think it, it really makes it so impactful. I did see something in the comments. I might just say is that we, I would say as 3GNY, in terms of our speaker program, we do find that our, what we say is more impactful in schools that are not just strictly Jewish schools. Well, I would like people feel like they've heard this before, right? Yeah, and in different ways, and it might not mean as much to them. So this is an interesting question, Who, someone who's basically saying, I have eight grandkids, they're not all interested or they don't ask about it. Um, how did you realize you were interested in these stories? And basically how can, how can we make three Gs interested in, in their grandparents' stories? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, just from my own experience, 
I only started when I was 25, really getting into it and researching it. I'm into history in general. So having this as part of my personal history, it made me really want to learn more. And, you know, it, uh, I would say it takes time for some people to come around to, to wanting to learn it. You know, as a kid, you don't want to necessarily push them into it, but not that it was ever pushed on me, but, you know, I obviously came into my own and wanted to kind of took off running here. But um, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, give them time, maybe give them a little tidbits here or there. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, dropping little crumbs and then maybe they want more and more. It's funny. I feel like most of the, th the three G's that I know, we basically all had to figure a lot out on our own. Um, yeah. And that is, is it gives us agency, right? It makes us feel like this is a story that belongs to us in some way too. Um, which brings me to my next question, which is how do you feel about being called a third generation survivor? Personally, as a fellow 3G, I really dislike the term as I have not survived anything like my grandparents and find it an unworthy comparison. Someone replies to say that they call themselves 3G descendants of survivors. So let's talk about this. Um, I will say to put all my cards out there, I got to college um, and I was in a freshman course on the Holocaust and I capitalized the word survivor because I was like, a survivor. I mean, and my professor had to sit me down and say, you know, that's not a proper noun, but to me it really <laughs> was. Um, so I think that we, I think that this is an interesting one to unpack. Where do you guys stand on this? 3G, I have against, to say, is like a nice shorthand. No, I'm, I'm very uh, against saying I'm a third generation survivor. I do not like the term. I'm a third generation of a survivor. I'm a descendant of a survivor. Uh, I don't want, I think the term third generation survivor means you survived something yourself. And that's not necessarily how I view it. My grandparents survived it. I am just their descendant. I would consider myself a third generation of a survivor. Could not agree more, absolutely. <laughs> Calling me a survivor in that context just actually feels completely wrong. <laughs> I mean, to me, third, I, I say third generation as short, as, as sort of not as shorthand as 3G, but you know, third generation because it, it sort of identifies me to the, to the trauma, right? Yeah. Like I'm third generation, I'm not the generation, not the child, okay. I mean, child of survivors is such a perfect terminology, right? Like that's what you are. And I think yeah. grandchild of survivors is sort of the way it's more comfortable it would be more comfortably um described um oh this is great i'm a child of survivors is there anything i shouldn't say to my children no tell them everything and tell them exactly how you felt in your experiences growing up in that way and um you know for me i've started asking just so many more questions about like how did it feel for you and what was it like for you to grow up in that way and the more i'm told the more i want to know and i think the more personal it is the better it's all it's all our real life experiences so i think nothing should be off the table i agree 100 percent um i would think everyone should know everything not sh a lot of people are like oh i never want to go see a camp Go see a camp. You need to see it because once you see it, then you're impacted just like what we're trying to impact other people. So I, I really believe that all details should be known no matter how gruesome they might be. It is actually very important. And then we sort of have the flip side of that question, which is what, if anything, do you want to know from your parents? And this is from a child of survivors with young adult children. And then I want to tie that with another question that came in that says, you talked about the Holocaust related effects of your grandparents on your parents. What would you say about the Holocaust related effects of your parents on you? So now we're talking, we're talking about those two G's. There's, they're there's here, they're watching on the zoom. So <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure my dad's watching, but um, there's a great impact uh, from two G's on us. And it does, as I think I kind of said before there, there is this kind of, you know, impact on them and an impact on us, not just straight from the grandparents and, I think that, you know, my dad had some serious hardships growing up. Um, I want to hear all those stories. He never told me anything uh, that much when he's younger about how hard it was. I've learned uh, more from my mom sometimes that she knows about my dad when he was younger. I don't know if it was just so hard on him if he blocked it all out, but I know that it's difficult. And even now, like I ask stories and new information comes out all the time that he never told, you know, me or my sister growing up. So 
it's difficult. I think that, you know, I would say <clears throat> when I was young, my dad wasn't maybe the warmest person, but I also know that it's not because he probably didn't try. It's probably because, you know, his parents uh, weren't as able to be as warm with him either, you know? So that does affect, it. that does come down. I mean, I'm sure there are other, many other traits as well, but um, uh, everything you do does have an effect on your kids probably for better or worse. You hear that guys? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, similarly, um, you know, my dad had a really difficult upbringing and didn't talk about it with me directly. I learned the most about that from my mom who shared it with me in kind of bits and pieces over the years, much more again in recent years with my involvement and asking more questions. And I guess as I've gotten older and they've stopped seeing me as a tiny little kid, but you know, I've in conversations with friends and other people, and I guess I don't say it enough to him directly, but dad, you're listening. I mean, it has always just really struck me with how lucky I am that my dad is the most incredible person and the warmest person my whole life, especially given the very difficult <laughs> upbringing that he had and, you know, not having a lot and just completely making an incredible life for his whole family uh, with very little support from his parents um, in because they, they couldn't. And some of that is psychologically they couldn't. And he also grew up quite poor in the Bronx from Holocaust survivors. So there's many different layers of that. Um, but so I've really, especially in recent times, thought so much about how lucky I am that that's, you know, my dad raised me and my family in such an incredible home full of warmth, despite a lot of the experiences that he was plagued with. So here is a very technical question, which I actually do not know the answer. Uh, how many three G's are there? Um, and then someone notes that, you know, with so many Holocaust survivors being really, really um, vulnerable in this COVID era, you know, those numbers seem to, to, to matter more than ever. Of course, we also get question, I got a question about, you know, are you three G if your grandparent wasn't in a camp? I mean, that's a, that's a big conversation. We don't need to have that right now, but do we have any sense of how many three G's there are? I also, someone wants to hug you, the two of you. <laughs> thank thank <laughs> you, Deborah, after. for the hug. <laughs> hug you back. <laughs> um, I have no idea how many 3Gs there are. Uh, that's a tough number to come by. I don't know if there's any actual calculation for that. Um, I don't, know how, I, don't know how, I don't know how to answer that one. <laughs> no, but I will say that the Young Friends of the Museum of Jewish Heritage has an amazing community. 3GNY has an amazing community. Both of our groups put on incredible events for 3Gs, social events, educational events, big, small, you know, you name it. There is a community here in New York City that wants to be embracing 3Gs. So please reach out to David, reach out to myself, get involved in both of our organizations as we both are involved with both. Um, yeah. There's really a thriving community here in New York. I can tell you it's not, I mean, obviously 3Gs are way more than New York. We're, there are actual 3G groups across the US in, in different cities. There's DC, there's a new one just in central Jersey that started, there's a Boston, there's Detroit, there's San Francisco. There are groups that haven't formalized in LA and South Florida and other regions. I would say not a week goes by where I don't get an email from someone wanting to discuss possibly starting up a 3G organization where they live. I had one in the past week from Arizona. I had one a month ago from someone in Sydney, Australia. So I think 3Gs are really yearning for this. I actually thought we hit the peak years ago, but really more and more people who are 3Gs really wanna get involved and, and, and do something, whether it's meet other 3Gs, feel that connection that, that we talked about, or, or do something with this story or life experience that uh, your grandparents had. So this is a question that also came in. Um, so often a film or TV show will reference the Holocaust to make a joke or point or even create a small storyline. 
for many of those films and programs, it's not relevant or necessary and it comes out of nowhere. Um, is this something 3Gs need to address to ensure that our peers and those younger than us don't misunderstand what the Holocaust is? I think I missed the beginning of that. the storyline. Sorry. Basically, <laughs> like if a film or TV show references the Holocaust at some point. That we have to get involved? I'm sorry, I missed that. I feel like this is about Hunters, that, that Amazon show that everyone was talking about. <laughs> Like, like, is it our responsibility as sort of like a younger generation of people who are engaging with pop culture to sort of be on the lookout for I ways think so. in which the Holocaust is memory is diminished? I think so. I think so. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a 3G's responsibility to carry on that legacy of that story to make sure it's not changed into something that is only fictionalized. I don't, it's okay to fictionalize it maybe, but to make it it's powerful on its own. It doesn't need to be fiction. Every story is so unique to everybody and everybody's family. And it's also history. These things happened. So we have to use this personal testimony to really make a difference. And in the future, as we don't have people who live during this period of time, so history doesn't repeat itself. I think there has to be some type of overlook into what's going on in the world and how these stories are used. Just opinion. Yeah, I think 3Gs need to use their voice um, as much as humanly possible. And I think, you know, for me personally, I, I think the Holocaust is one of many subjects that I think never deserves levity in that way. So for me personally, it's, um, it's things I stay away from. Oh, this is a, a big question. How will you tell your children differently than your parents shared with you? So this idea of, okay, 4G, I mean, there's, there's 4Gs already, right? That's or maybe our next event could be just like me talking to 4Gs um, about how they feel about the Holocaust. But um, how, have you thought about the ways in which you want to continue this, this chain and, and basically maybe do things differently? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you go first. Go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think I'm not going to be afraid to tell my children today about the Holocaust. And I think it's all about how you talk to your kids about the Holocaust at whatever age you start. You know, I don't think you need to wait until they're almost grown children because you need to tell them all of the details that are really way too heavy for a young child to internalize. But there are ways to communicate to children as young as an elementary school to say, you know, our family went through something very significant or, you know, there are different ways to teach and talk about that story. And um, one of the things that the We Do program does so well is it, it teaches you how to alter your story to different audiences, different age groups, um, to just be comfortable nuancing your story to the right audience in that way. And so I, I do think I will start talking about it sooner. And I think it'll just be all about, you know, what is the right what is the right information what's the most important piece of the information a lot of the times it's not even the nitty-gritty details of exactly every moment of their experience that is often hardest to internalize i think um yeah total i i like like we're saying before as as 3gs we're more free to do things we are more free maybe to share information as well i know that we did probably didn't even have as many tools as when we were younger as we do now. Even someone here who I, I believe is probably watching, um, I know Courtney who helps run the 3GDC program. She, re she, she wrote a, a children's book. Um, that's an entry point right there at an early age to what a story might be. Even if I wrote down my grandmother's story in a different way and presented it in a more you know, easy manner to read. I mean, like my grandmother, I view as a hero. And, you know, kids have all types of heroes, you know, whether they're cartoon characters, real life or TV, I can present that as this is my hero and this is the story and it can evolve as they get older. Thank you. I'm so inspired by talking to the two of you. It just seems like you're doing <laughs> such amazing work. I will point out that someone correctly notes that there are 4Gs who are old enough to talk about this. Um, definitely. There are. Um, totally. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and this was, a, this was a lot of fun, you guys. I think, um, 
I just love hanging with three G's and I appreciate you both taking the time. Oh, I'm hearing that the four G's are more interested than the three G's. That's what the chat is saying. I don't know about that. Um, Come on. <laughs> who knows? We'll see. They're going to start their own event series uh, and put us out of business soon. Um, but, you know, I just want to thank you, Alyssa, David, um, and the whole team at the, muse uh, the Museum of Jewish Heritage for putting this on. I'm really excited for the rest of the series. I think this is going to be a, a tough act to follow. You guys were were really, really great. Um, and everyone will get more information about 3GNY and the Museum of Jewish Heritage and the Young Friends program um, after the show. And now awesome. we're going to hear from Samantha again. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, Alyssa, David, for this wonderful discussion. Uh, we hit on a lot of really interesting themes that I also can't wait to continue unpacking in future installments of this series. So Alyssa, David, we so appreciate you taking the time to share your unique 3G experiences with us. And Stephanie, thank you for being our gracious host. Uh, to our viewers watching, make sure to check out Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox, for more inf interviews by Stephanie and her uh, lively co-hosts with interesting Jews and non-Jews from all walks of life. Uh, tonight's program was recorded and will be available for viewing hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we upload all museum public programs to YouTube and I'll send out that link to our registrants as soon as it's up. Uh, if you like this program, please consider making a donation to the museum or becoming a member. Our free public programs are made possible with support from wonderful viewers like you and we so appreciate them. Uh, and the museum is hosting online programs twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you can stay plugged into those happenings by subscribing to our newsletter, following us on social media, and visiting our website, mjhnyc.org. So thank you again, Stephanie, Alyssa, and David. It was great.